All right, we are live. Wayne? Yes, sir. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you uh, for joining me today. And um, I had a trombone player on yesterday who said that he was anxious to hear this and he so enjoyed everything you did with uh, Pete Escovito. Oh. And he said he'd never met you, but he was a fan. Oh, all good. And uh, the, so the song I just played was was you. And uh, I just want to say if anybody wants to hear any of your music, that they can find it on iTunes or CD Baby or anything. Uh, and the good thing is you can't find it just to download to play for free. <laughs> you know, you actually have to purchase the music, I think. That's interesting. Uh, there might be some stuff on Spotify, but that's so inexpensive. And if you have a subscription, it's not a big deal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, there, and there is some stuff on uh, YouTube also. So, oh. and that, yeah, it, 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 search, look around, you'll find things. But I, I kind of appreciate the fact that people, sometimes it's good to be able to download some stuff for free and listen. But I, I also like the fact that you people have to pay sometimes for music because there's so much free stuff that there's an expectation sometimes that, Oh, we should just be able to get it for free. Mm -hmm. you know? I know that's become a thing. And that right. goes, it goes back to Nap Napster and the intellectual property uh, discussion that we had with Napster. Um, yeah. It's really interesting. Um, if it's a creative art endeavor, it should be, unless a, the author, he or she says, here, take it for free, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they won't be able to keep creating if they're not, you don't even have to make a lot of money, just be compensated so you can continue making the art. Right, right. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, there, there was a couple, when we talked the other day, I'm, I'm actually looking forward to this conversation because it, it's going to be a continuation of what we talked about the other day. First, um, what's going on with, I know you're teaching at uh, uh, Indiana University at Jacobs School of Music. And how is that shaping up for the fall uh, semester for you? Uh, uh, <laughs> to be determined, actually, uh, there are some things that are known, but there's so many unknowns for everyone, not just me. Mm. Um, I'm at risk. So being over 65, I'm not mandated to actually have face-to-face -face contact with students. So even if I was, I'm in San Francisco at the moment, but if I was in Indiana, I wouldn't go on campus mm. under these cur current circumstances because everything is so, for lack of a better term, loosey-goosey, even though they're trying their best to make things safe for everybody. I don't think mm -hmm. we have a hand up uh, that uh, understatement of the year. I don't think we have a handle on this thing yet. And yeah. every, I think everybody's at risk, not just the teachers, but the students, the people that turn on the lights, the people that take care of building maintenance, everything. So I'm going to do my stuff remote, even the ensembles. And that's going to be a real struggle because it's very artificial, but we're going to, We'll know more in the next few days, I think, at least as far as mine. I know the California school system and Governor Newsom just came in out with this shelter in place. So, yes, I wish I could give you a more definitive answer. But for me, it's just basically I'm doing remote teaching. Yeah. And mostly through Zoom and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Zoom is the preferred uh, platform. Right. And... Uh, the other thing that I wanted, you gave, gave me a couple of books that I sort of, I, I, I didn't have time to, to really read them, but I, I skimmed through. Um, uh, the one that struck me, we talked a little bit about the Midwest, is the Hillbilly uh, Elegy. Yeah. 
<laughs> you know, I, I almost, I, as I kind of skim through it, I'm like, Hey, that's my story. That, <laughs> that's kind of where I came from, you know, mm -hmm. um, but uh, and the thing that I wanted to talk to you is your history in San Francisco and you have spent a lot of time uh, learning about the music history of San Francisco as well. Yes. And it's, so, it's, it's kind of a hobby. Yeah. You grew up in, uh, in the Fillmore area. Yeah. Uh, and it, through the, the time of the, uh, I, for lack of a better term, the, the heyday in uh, San Francisco music between what the mid sixties to maybe almost the mid seventies where yeah. the music creativity was just spilling out everywhere. Yeah, it was. Yeah, and it was, a, it was a golden era. It, it, you, how did you get involved in music and what led you to trombone and, and all of that? It's the opposite of what's happening with our public education system now. When mm -hmm. I was in when I was in elementary school, they had a program where they brought around ins instruments and asked us if we wanted to play it. They offered mm -hmm. it to us, and um, my mother had the foresight also to let, ask me if I wanted to try to play piano. I said sure, and I tried it. So I was doing both, and it was very natural, just like in uh, sports at school. It was offered and that changed in the seventies, which I'm sorry for, but that was, mm -hmm. that was an option to anybody at any San Francisco public school. Man, wouldn't it be nice if that was still available? It is in some places in the Midwest. That's the thing that I, um, I've learned. I, I'm ping ponging a little bit, but there's a lot more access to those things in the Midwest. Uh, what was it? Um, the sports programs got cut in the 70s to save our sports snack or SNCC, whatever it was called. There was an acronym for it, Big Rally at Kizar Stadium when it existed. And slowly but surely, it just kept drifting away to where we're at, where we're at now. Mm. So uh, then when you started, did you just pick the trombone? Is, was there something that drew you to that instrument? Hey, I have a running joke about that. I picked, uh, little did I know, it's, it's, for those of you that don't play trombone, it's really, really hard. But in, in my infinite childish youth, I went, oh, that one's easy. It just has one moving part. <laughs> <laughs> totally wrong. <laughs> oh, you know, I I do have a fascination of, of being able to with a trombone it's, it's almost like playing an upright bass where your finger could end up anywhere but you have to be in a specific spot in order to make it in tune and it with the right pitch yeah. and all right you started on the the story about the violin yeah non-pitched instruments acoustic right. bass violin viola cello your finger has to be placed in the same place, approximately the same place every time for it to sound in tune, which is why young musicians that don't have the muscle memory sound so bad on that or trombone. Mm. It, and it, it takes a while to learn to, to kind of intuitively go to those positions on the, on the trombone, doesn't it? Yes, it really does. It takes some time. Once you get it, it feels good, uh, especially when you're reading. Jazz is another thing because you don't know what you're going to play till you play it. So you have to have this coordinated thing in your mind with your hand of I'm going and be thinking about the next thing. It's trombone is really hard. Hmm. Mm -hmm. What? Um, so when you were growing up as a as a kid, then what what were your influences? Were you listening to a lot of Bay Area music at the time? Well, actually, my parents started me off with Nat King Cole, had a Charlie Parker record. Uh, what was the other one besides Nat King Cole? Louis Jordan. We had a bunch of Louis Jordan records here in the house. Um, mm -hmm. My mother was from Texas, my father from Oklahoma. They moved here in the 40s, of course, um, both children of the Depression and um, when I think the, uh, the Dust Bowl. Dust Bowl because they were in Oklahoma and Texas, moved out here during the war and met 
And they brought that sensibility and the rest of my family, my aunts and stuff moved out here also following my mother. I'm, except for one cousin, I'm the only musician in the family. Really? Yeah. Uh, so you kind of made your own way with music. Uh, out, you, at, once they give you the influence of Nat King Cole and, and some of that stuff, and did you just then kind of found your own way through music? Well, yeah, because I love the I love those records. So I would learn the words. I learned our love is here for to stay. I would sing along with Nat, and eventually, at some point, I started picking them out on piano and stuff. Um, well, I remember, like I figured out Alfie and this guy's in love with you, like with uh, Burt Bacharach, those type of songs. Just picking them out by ear. And as time went on, we had good music. I had good teachers. They taught me how to, of course, read and write and all of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the as you pro progress, you know, I, I I don't know who I was talking with about this, but a lot of times as as kids, we learn by ear is the first way we learn to uh, learn music is just by ear and, and try to emulate or like you were just describing. But at some point we need to learn how to read music and learn all of the, the basics and fundamentals of music in order to really sustain a career, right? Yeah, unless you can carve your own niche, yes. I mean, Irving Berlin didn't uh, read music. And it's, that, it's that whole thing where we had the, the tunable piano, where he had these levers where he could change keys. He could only play in C major. Really? Yeah, so we had this little piano thing where like if you could move the lever, um, it would put it in D flat, move the lever again, it put it in D. And that's how he moved around the keys. Really? I didn't know there was a piano that could do that. Yeah. It's kind of like, like a capo on guitar, you know, you put it on the fretboard and I mean, because you're still playing and you made it just, a, it changes the key. Wow. So uh, when you start with students, do you, do you teach any beginning students? I have for a long time. Now that I'm in Indiana, everybody I get is like a, not a child prodigy, but very, very proficient. Mm -hmm. I don't have to, I don't have to teach a lot of technique. But for a long time, I was doing that. And we spent time, like we were just talking about, like building muscle memory. Mm -hmm. I'd have them say the note, sing it, play it. Actually, I didn't play it, just go B flat, C, D, E flat, F. So it would be in their body. Because mm -hmm. a large part of like a brass instrument is like, you can't go B flat and have a, you're playing a B out here. It's a total mental disconnect. Mm. With, a trump, with a trumpet or a saxophone, you press down a valve or a key, it responds in a different way. Mm. Uh, in educating with the, uh, the those uh, adv more uh, maybe advanced students, do you focus on, do you teach a lot of music history? Because when we were talking the other day, you have a vast amount of of music history, especially the San Francisco Bay Area. And I'm I'm fascinated by your knowledge of the history of music, uh, especially in San Francisco. Do you get into any of that in edu in your education with kids, uh, like at Stanford Jazz Workshops and in Indiana and stuff? More so on the college level. Mm -hmm. uh, high school, it's a little tougher, but on the college level, you can do that. And I do a couple of classes, besides the Latin Jazz Ensemble we have out at uh, Jacobs School of Music, I do a class on uh, music of the Americas, where we talk about the different countries and their influences and colonialism and history and how it relates to the United States. A lot of people have just been exposed to salsa or maybe Mexican music. Mm -hmm. if, we're lucky, if we're lucky, Cuban music. So we do Puerto Rico, we do Colombia, Peru, and all those different countries and how they connect with the United States. The other class, which is more of what we're discussing about, is called um, our, my, uh, my R and, uh, Rhythm and Blues Soul class. We take the history of rhythm and blues starting in the 1930s and move it up to the 1970s. We start with Sister Rosetta Tharp. No, I don't even touch jazz. I just leave that as a separate thing. There's, mm. some, jazz, there's some jazz influences in it, but we start with Sister Rosetta Tharp, go to Lewis Jordan, then go to Ray Charles, 
Chess Records, Stax Records, um, whom I, Atlantic Records, and move forward. On, and I end on Parliament Funkadelic and just take them up into the mid 70s. You end with Parliament. <laughs> now, so, well, the, and, and so the root of Parliament then, you're, you're tracing back to the 30s. It all connects. I mean, yeah. it, 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 if, if, if you think of like the Harlem, uh, what's the, the Harlem Book of Slang and all the code words that were done in that in the 30s. Uh -huh. And like Sister Rosetta Tharp, if you listen to her play guitar and you hear Chuck Berry, almost everybody in the 50s, uh, Sister Rosetta Tharp was a superstar from the mm -hmm. late 20s into the 30s moving forward. And a lot of the English rock musicians knew who she was. Eric Clapton's all those folks. She was a big hit in Europe. Mm. Uh, she was a big hit also on the gospel circuit here in the United States. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Now, where does the jazz I, explain more of the the different uh, Latin actually the the different uh, styles? Uh, you just there's Peru, Colombia, Cuba. Mexico, all of those different flavors, uh, how do they all kind of mesh when they come together here in the States? Well, the the overt version that everybody's familiar with is salsa. And that's a mix of Afro-Cuban music with an influence of music from Puerto, Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic. But it also has a component of R&B, like early Boogaloo. A lot of American, African-Americans were intermingling with Puerto Rican society in the, in the late 60s as it was evolving to become salsa. And it's kind of like what happened with um, rap music because a lot of them got disenfranchised from what had happened with Tito Puente and Tito Rodriguez and Machito, and they want their own style of music. And it became a harder, more street edge type of thing. So you get Willie Colon, Larry Harlow, all those folks, and it became revolutionary. It's no coincidence, it, it happened around the time of the Black Panthers and the Students for Democratic Society. Everyone was looking for a new way to culturally, mm -hmm. self-identification culturally, from the previous generation. The civil rights movement was still going on, but if you think of what happens in like 68, 69, 70, which leads to Parliament Funkadelic again, all of that was like outgrowth of the Vietnam War. Uh, George Clinton said one of the major influences on their music was like the Vietnam War. Interesting. Wow. The Oh yeah, it, it, all, it all ties together. Now I didn't, I didn't totally, I didn't totally answer your question about the countries, but Cuban music and all that stuff, it was right. totally influencing everything on an unconscious level, not so much on a technical level. You can listen to Sam Cooke, you can listen mm -hmm. to Bo Diddley, Chuck Berry, can't, 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 can't. That's called, that's like a tracio tres pattern of three, doc, 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 or what's called the Bo Diddley beat. Mm -hmm. And that music is from New Orleans, um, a lot of expatriate Cubans moved to New Orleans after the Haitian Revolution. So all that music got transferred to New Orleans and there was a ship line from Miami to New, let me get it right, Miami, New Orleans, Havana, Cartagena, and just like all the musicians were traveling of this and interchanging information. It was a natural evolution of culture. Mm. So the the Bo Diddley beat kind of came came from Cuban music or Puerto After, Rico. Uh, no, it, it was it's been credited to the Cubans more than anything. Like if you think of the habanera rhythm, which is in Carmen from like habanera. Da, 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 it was kind of became mm -hmm. a universal thing throughout what we call Latin America, but the Cubans refined it mm -hmm. to the point where it became mm -hmm. more closely associated with them. 
It's in tango. Mm -hmm. You hear it in tango all the time. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I, and, and where does tango come from? Is that is that more of a European? Uh, no, no, it's, a, it's Argentinian. Uh, it, it arose from the gauchos on the pampas of, uh, of the plains of uh, Argentina. And when it moved to the city, like just like music moved to New Orleans, it went into the brothels and it became a dance. The tango is actually a dance between a prostitute and a pimp. It's, it's, mm. it's, it's lived out through that dance. Wow. And, and, then, so, and then, it, then it went to Europe because the upper class of Argentina didn't like it. It was too rough and tumble for them. It went to mm -hmm. Europe and the Europeans loved it. And that's why there's like a gazillion variations of tango from Europe. And it transculturated back to Argentina. Okay. Yeah, oh, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating story. Yeah. And how... We were talking the other day about how all of that made its way to San Francisco and uh, the 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 Barbary Coast and all of the music that was coming into San Francisco did a lot. And a lot of that kind of came from from New Orleans as well. And I know I'm getting off the Latin thing, but as you were describing how music circulated through. Uh, uh, Cuba, New Orleans, and 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 around. How did it all of that music get into the Bay Area? Well, being a port city, uh, all the diverse amount of varied cultures. But I, my opinion, the gold rush, the whole thing of everybody coming from Europe. Uh, Isabel Allende has a great book called Daughter of Fortune that chronicles the rush and the mania of the gold rush with everybody leaving everything behind in Europe from Chile and just coming around the Cape and getting to San Francisco, coming from Asia. And San Francisco is, you, it's exactly what it is now. It's just such a multi-ethnic city because of that. People will gotta get off the boat. They talk about that, the Embarcadero where it is now. When they first started building it, again, mm -hmm. building it, they found all these burnt ships at the bottom of the water because people would get off the boats and just the whole crew would leave and go up to the Sierra Nevadas. They had to burn down the ships so more boats could come. <laughs> oh, they, that's a, they just they just get off the boat and just leave it. The story was Man. the urban myth was that as soon as you step foot into San Francisco, you were going to step on gold. That's a myth that was going around Europe and the rest of the world. Wow. Yeah, so, it's, it's you know, it makes sense. Go ahead. You, Go ahead. It, it makes sense a little bit that San Francisco was such a multicultural city more so than maybe Los Angeles. Yes. Yeah. Would So when when people ended up in in San Francisco, they were going because of the gold rush and that's how it all everything funneled into california from san francisco to san and, francisco and there's one other physical manifestation of why los angeles is different the train went to los angeles and stopped there there wasn't a direct line of a train coming up to san francisco till later in the 20th century but that train went up to oakland mm -hmm which is why there's less of an African-American community in San Francisco and a greater one in Oakland. Oh, that's interesting. And, and in San Francisco, it's more uh, Asian, uh, Hispanic, maybe. Yeah. And it's and interesting. In Oakland? Yeah, um, not, uh, not really. I think there was, it was equal in that respect, but it's not as many African Americans. Um, mm. The thing I've, I've, I've talked to several people about this, like when the jazz age started in San Francisco, they would, the musicians, mainly African American, would come for the weekend on the ferry to San Francisco because the bridges didn't exist. And they'd play, stay mm. in town for the whole weekend and then go back across the bay. When the bridge was in, the Bay Bridge is 1936, something like that. Um, that changed things then. Then we could move around more. 
Mm. And what was a lot of the music happening in the brothels? In, it was in, in San Francisco in those days. Uh, the, uh, no, no, no. The Barbary Coast. If you went on Broadway in San Francisco, it, it's the way it is now. Like where it's a tourist mecca. It was like that from mm -hmm. 1856 on, and it was the the brothels were more toward where Chinatown is now. It was called Dupont, Dupont Circle, I believe. And then eventually, mm. after the mm. earthquake, it became Chinatown. There was this whole thing around the beginning of the 20th century. Mm. Um, we have strong history with the Asian community in. Um, I don't know if you've yeah. talked to Anthony Brown or John Chang, but Francis Wong, but the Asian American jazz scene here researches and goes back and studies like our connection with the African American society, like when Japantown was part of um, the film work until the until World War II. And of course, they deported everyone. They came back and they've rebuilt it back to being J-Town. But we've always had a connection mm -hmm. in the film world with that. Mm. And how did, where you grew up in the Fillmore, how was that music thriving? Was there a, a, a I, I know when you were young, that there was a, a pretty good music scene in the Fillmore. And how was that separate from uh, the um, downtown around the Chinatown and, and that area? Was it different? Oh, or yeah, yes. It, yes, it was different. Um, I think we discussed this, but um, Van Ness Street was a dividing line. It was a color dividing line where African-Americans from the Musician Union were not allowed to play on the east side of San Francisco, but you could play to the west side, southwest in the Fillmore. So if you were, uh, oh, I want to say Pearl Bailey or even Sammy Davis Jr., that's where you would gravitate to after you finished your gig wherever you had played. Mm. You know, we talked about that on on uh, on Saturday, but I don't know if a lot of people, especially younger people, younger than than me, uh, that there was a time when there the musicians union, there was a black musicians union and a white musicians union. And yeah. you, you brought that to my attention. And I don't think I even was aware of it. And the fact that as a black musician, at one time, you could only play on one side of Van Ness. Yeah, that... it, if you if you did during the Barbary Coast era, it wasn't bad. But as, as things moved on, it became um, tough. Became really tougher, and a lot of places were not the union. The concept of un, being a union musician was really different. I caught the tail end of it because uh, I joined the union in. 68, 69, 1970, yeah, around that time. And that's mm -hmm. when it was integrated. But I had mm -hmm. older black musicians talk, talking to me about that. What mm -hmm. was it? Um, Thelonious Monk, Billy Holiday, both had their cabaret cards taken away from them. That was the basic thing. They couldn't work in New York without what was called a cabaret card. Um, Billy's was for uh, drugs. And I think Monks was too, or else something. It, it might have been like a trumped up charge, but you couldn't work. Mm. And they all, and you can all, the, the Musicians Union was much stronger then. If you were playing a gig, somebody would go come up and say, let me see your union card. Make sure you pay your union dues and all of that. Yeah. It, and it, when, when you joined the union, it was, it was still, fairly strong then wasn't it yeah yes it was um and i think the union started to lose its power when when did california become a right to work state now that's a good did, question did that have a lot to do with that's a good question did, I, I, did that I, have a lot i don't yeah, know the, go ahead i don't know the details on that i think the biggest strangle a hold on the union was uh, when things like rent came and they cut down the number of musicians that could be in the pit. And you didn't have like the Tony Bennett's coming mm. into the Fairmont and things like that, where they would hire 20 musicians. All they would do is bring their rhythm section and hire all the horns. I caught 
tail end of that. That's how I ended up working with Ray Charles and Sammy Davis Jr. and Dion Ward, people like that, because they would have their book, they'd have their rhythm section, and then they hire locally. So we had a chance. Oh, Lena Horn, same thing. We'll, we'll work with them like that. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And and those guys, those uh, people were playing at that time, like at the Fairmont and some of those kinds of places in the Venetian room and stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. It was much more, I, I caught it at just a good time. I remember, who was it? It was Sinatra or Tony Bennett. Um, well, there's two stories of this, actually. Uh, after Alan Smith, trumpet player here, like a contemporary of Dizzy Gillespie. He could have been, if he wanted to, he could have been like Dizzy Gillespie. But Tony Bennett was playing the fair, and he said, if, Tony, if Alan Smith doesn't play, I don't play. So that helped. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that helped. It, 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 it always takes people like that. We're talking about the Black Lives Matter movement. It takes somebody to take a stand. And, you know, things right. change. Sammy Davis Jr. was the part, a part owner of the Circle Star Theater when it was happening. For those, if, if you don't know what that is, just go to Wikipedia, it's a theater in the realm. There was about six of them in, throughout the country. Mm -hmm. and, and he said, I remember uh, I did a casual with Alan Smith and we're playing a gig. This is one, I got funny stories like this. I love the old school musicians because they everything mm -hmm. they do is oblique. It's never straightforward. We're playing a, a casual, and for those, right. who don't, for those who don't know what the casual get is, it's just a gig, a contractor hires you, you play whatever, whatever's put in front of you, you get paid, you go home, good night. Um, yeah. So we're sitting there, we're halfway through the gig, and Alan just looks at me and goes, can you read? And I said, well, I thought I could, I'm on the gig. I, I think, yes, I can read. And the next thing I know, in a couple of days, I get a, I get a call, to go to play at the Circle Star Theater because Sammy Davis Jr. had said, I'm going to be playing there for a week. And if I don't see some black faces in that band, you're all fired. The contractor had to bend to him. Wow. Yep. But it, 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 that, that's kind of what it, it, it needed that in order to get black musicians to be able to play. Well, I was at the, the civil rights movement. The bill had been passed in '64, so it was it was gathering steam, and you had Sly and the Family Stone. It, it all kind of goes together. Um, the Bay Area has always been a lot more accepting about integrated, quote unquote, integrated groups. Uh, you look at a band like Sly; it was integrated and gen gender integrated. We didn't have a lot of bands like that. The women were just as important in Sly's band as any of the men. Mm. So we, I always took it, almost every band I've been in had a woman in it, <laughs> to tell the truth. Uh, if, if not specifically as a linear approach to come in, go out, and really good musicians, no problems, you know, no fluff, no nothing. So we never thought of it as a, yeah. being a big deal. Mm. It, it, the, the, you know, I always liked the Bay Area because of that, of all of those things. It, it's just a, a lot of a mix of different people. And, and, and you know, you're, there are a lot of women players in the Bay Area that were playing all the time I was there. Yeah, yeah, very good musicians. I mean, musicians are musicians and people apply themselves and they do what they do. Yeah. Yeah, it's on the band yeah. leaders so, to hire people. Correct. What what is uh, what was it like when you worked with Sammy Davis? He's funny. He was he <laughs> he was so funny. Um, we we'd be backstage before the show. Maybe he did this all the time, but I I, I always liked it because he had a string section. And then we had the jazzers, right? So that was the whole Sammy thing, you know, very elegant, big band. And he'd walk in, he'd make a joke out of it, and he'd do it on stage, says, I come in, it's nice. The string players are sitting over there in the room tuning up. And I go, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, how are you? Did you have a lovely day? And he'd say, yes. Then he'd walk by the jazz musician, hey, you mothers. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 
<laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Oh. Lena, oh. Horn, Lena Horn was like that too. She, she was smart. She always knew that where her bread was buttered, she would hang out with us. Mm. We, we would run through a wall for Lena because she was literally one of the guys. Mm. She could sit down, she, she'd always come in and say hi before every performance. Mm. What, what was it? Yeah, what was, I'm trying to think of uh, the gold, not the Golden Gate Theater, the Orpheum, at the Orpheum Theater. You could walk all the way to her dressing room from the street level. But when she would make a point to come downstairs, say hello to us, go to the other side, then walk up to her dressing room. Mm. That's old. That's very old school. Very, very old school. Yeah. You know, um, when when you were, were playing then from like in the 70s through the 80s, were the, those were the days when all of those people were still performing and still uh, having bands. Uh, it seems as though a lot of those kinds of gigs have disappeared where they, they hire full bands like they used to in those days. Right. And, uh, you know, be, maybe it's a, an age thing because the music that all of those folks were playing was more big band, uh, you know, orchestra kind of orientated. And then, then you've got, uh, now bands that are doing that are like Huey Lewis and maybe those kinds of bands that just a different time. Yeah. Everything changed. I think rent was the first one where they were using more synthesizers or it mm. was, uh, or else it was, um, what am I thinking? Dream girls. Dream girls was mm. kind of like an R and R B thing that happened when the whiz dream girls, things like that started coming on to Broadway, the move slowly went to synthesizers. And we've seen that like uh, Avenue Q and everything else, and or pre-recorded parts with maybe five or six live musicians. Yeah, that's when it really started changing. And now uh, there, most of the things are uh, uh, two or three keyboards. Yeah. And maybe a horn player or two. Right. Yeah. And it's economics. The tickets, I mean, Broadway productions are so expensive to mount. Uh, they had to work out, you actually going back to the unions, mm -hmm. uh, the Broadway theater people kind of went rogue on them and they had to um, make a special deal to, to allow them to get the show in there. Mm -hmm. And they, and that's, they kind of capitulated and it's been like that ever since. Mm. What now you were doing all of that stuff, but, how how did you get find yourself in the middle of all of the, the Latin stuff? Were you always fascinated with that? Did it start with with playing with Pete, or how did all of the Latin come about for you? Well, it's interesting. Um, pre Pete, um, I was on Broadway because I was working at the Peppermint Tree back in 1970, 71. And uh, the first real exposure I had was with uh, Caesar's band when he, when he was on Green Street before he moved over to Mission Street. And mm. that's why I met, I met a lot of those people. But a lot, about a year later, Azteca was formed and I met Pete. Uh, I couldn't play in Azteca because it was just, my timing was off. But then I got asked to play with Pete's band with Sheila when they were the house band on Monday nights at Keystone Corner over on Vallejo Street. Mm. So I, I started getting into this. It came, it came backwards. It came in on the Latin jazz side. And then at some point again, I think in the early 80s, I got involved with playing with uh, Caesars Band when it was on Mission Street. And when the Club Bay Jones was on Valencia Street, I was playing in two bands there. And that was more like uh, Salsa, Ray Barreto, some Eddie Palmieri stuff. But Caesar's band was like the old school stuff, more like uh, the Fania All Stars. Mm. So even though I didn't, I wasn't intimate. I didn't intimately know about all those people, but I, but I learned all those songs. And as time went on, and I got in my chete, and I started studying the the progenitors of the music, and going back deeper and looking at Tito and all of that. That's when I that's when I kind of got thrown into that. And that's like late eighties, early nineties. You know, you know what fascinates me about you, Wayne, is is I, I 
we've never really talked except for the hour we talked on Saturday and now. And what strikes me is your when you get thrown into something or do something, you want to explore it and learn about it just because uh, of the stories you've told me. It seems like when you started learning Latin, then you wanted to know, you wanted to dig deeper and you would go and research it. Mm -hmm. And it's like you did with the jazz stuff of San Francisco. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, that I, I so appreciate that. And, learning about all of the different Latin stuff then and wanting to know about it. And then it also gives you a wealth of knowledge to be able to teach. And it's very, it's been helpful. It helped, uh, I try this one thing from the teaching standpoint, I try to stimulate prod my students intellectual curiosity. And mm. I don't, I just don't like to just give them the answers. I like to say, well, why did this happen? I don't know. Well, if you, were in that, if you were in that position, what would you do? Well, I don't know. Well, let's talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, and make them try to think out uh, on their own. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. that's a, I think that's a teacher's real job. It's mm. just a student's, it doesn't matter what style of music you play. As long as you're intellectually curious, curious it's going to be a natural progression towards whatever your manifest destiny is going to be. Right. And uh, when when you were doing all, uh, then uh, all of the, the Latin stuff, uh, I, and I'm fascinated, uh, again, uh, the, the difference between uh, a Peruvian beat or uh, Ar Argentina, uh, and uh, I, I want to try to say Cuba correctly, Cuba. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, and... Do you, when you write music or, or do your own stuff, do you uh, uh, specifically think, oh, I'm going to do this kind of style, or you just mix it all together in a pot like a stew? If I'm learning a new, I would have to say Afro Peruvian music, like a Lando or any of those tunes, a festejo, I'm still learning how to deal with that. Fortunately, mm -hmm. we have a great uh, teacher in Indiana who's from Peru. And I've invited him to some of my classes, and he started to explain the, su the subtleties of the different styles and how to play the cajon, the box instrument, how they mm. interpret the music. So once again, just I just sit there and say, I'm a student. If you guys aren't listening, I'm listening. I'm learning something here. <laughs> so did, did the cajon, is that a Peruvian instrument? I believe so, if I remember correctly. It went to Spain. I believe so. I'm going to say yes, because the cajon is mainly, principally used in Peru, Cuba, Cuba, and Spain. Mm. You know, they don't. They and don't yeah. have. They don't have hand drums. Think about it. Cuba has um, drums with skins, metal, tuning pegs, boxes. I mean, there's 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 boxes. The cajon, the concept of boxes, wooden boxes, is used. In, in, in Cuba because they didn't have the means for it. And that's the mm. ingenuity of you make do of whatever you have. Uh, Trinidadian and steel drums are the same thing. I mean, they, they took the oil cans and figured out a way to make musical instruments out of it. The, uh, the steel drums, did, did steel drums uh, originate in Trinidad? Yeah. And uh, because that's another fascinating instrument is how, how they can hammer uh, different pitches out of the the lid of a steel drum. Well, the thing is, when you're denied access to the other instruments, you make up your own. Mm. That's been one of the greatest things about the Western Hemisphere. If we've been forced to create things, think about uh, early um, uh, rap music where they kids in New York they'd run out of money for the schools. They said, "Oh, hell, I'll get a turntable. I'll figure out how to make." Make a procrastinist man out of an electric turntable. Hmm. Change the world. You know, I never really th thought about it from that perspective. Uh, as I, I can't get a real instrument, so I'll just use this. Yeah. Let's go, see, let's go back in the South. The same thing. The banjo is basically an African instrument. It's, it's, it goes by another name. People would do, uh, it's got the hand bone to use your body. That's used. 
spoons, whatever's handy, you find some way to, you know, you approximate your culture with whatever's you have available to you. Do you, do you know the story about brushes? I heard, and, and I don't know, that, that brushes that drummers use, mm -hmm. it was originally a fly swatter. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> and that, that somebody just took it and started yeah. using it some drums. I wouldn't be surprised because if you're looking for different sounds and how to separate yourself, um, I, could, I could see that. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think back in the 1920s when early, early recording technology didn't allow for bands to play the way they would normally play live? Because they had to space them out. It was one take, uh, that big cylinder that we've always seen from the 1920s. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't stand right, it would the balance would be horrible. The, in the stories of Louis Armstrong, he was so powerful, he had to stand 16 feet away or he would overpower the whole band. Drummers are always playing either with brushes or really light and no cymbal crashes because it would have destroyed the balance of the recording. We don't have accurate recordings of what those bands sounded like in 1920, 1921, maybe up to 25, till the technology caught up with it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think... I was talking with uh, a recording engineer and the difference between pe the way you, people used to record where the in those days, um, the musician had to have a perfect performance or as close to perfect as you could get in order to make the recording good. These days, these days, they just go, people just go in and sing and play and, and let the engineer fix it. Here you go. You fixed it. Yeah, so, basically. Yeah, basically. And uh, it, it's kind of it, the musicians having to play well has sort of in that regard. I mean, you still need to play well, but they they rely on the engineer to fix a lot of stuff instead of making themselves just play better. Uh, jazz is an imperfect art. And. If you can listen to them, as I've gotten older, I listen back to records I love, and I just go, "Damn, that's out of tune." And I just had, <laughs> and I just had, I just hadn't noticed it before, because on some level, some visceral level, I loved it. But now mm -hmm. that I have my so-called intellectual musical brain, I can go back and tear <laughs> it apart and go like, "Oh, oh, forget that. It still sounds good." <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. What's your, what's your favorite when, you know, I mean, I know this is going to sound kind of, you, you know, the, the typical, what's your favorite music, but when you want to just put on something to listen to, what do you put on to listen to? No, actually, for the last couple of years, I've stopped listening to stuff because I'm surrounded by it so much. When I'm in India, when I'm in Indiana, I mean it's a twenty-four-seven thing almost. I almost have to decompress, and it's mm. all high quality, all high quality music. Um, I've been involved with a lot of different projects where, if I'm not playing, I'm helping produce or arrange, or in some form or another, and it just you have to get away from it after a little while. Lately, I haven't been listening to much. Something will catch my ear, and my students always bring me stuff. I've stopped listening to music in the car, actually, too. Um, I'm just kind of a little bit of quiet. I mean, we're at such a strange age right now. I don't mind having some quiet. I'll probably get back into it. Yeah, I can appreciate that. You know, um, I hadn't really listened to music too much. Uh, before, but these last 18 weeks that the pandemic thing has been hitting us and I've started doing these interviews and just, it, I, I do them mainly just to uh, give myself something to do, but what it's done is it's made me pull out a lot of old music and listen to it again. It just like before today I was listening to a couple of Pete's uh things and mm -hmm. and this one this record yours uh, of yours this uh Latin jazz jazz Latin mm -hmm. 
you know, and, and then the song uh, that I played to open and it's, it's made me go back and listen to some old records that I used to listen to all the time. And I'm remembering when I was younger and how struck I was by the music and I just played over and over and over and over. And um, now I, I can't listen to music when I, at all when I try to fall asleep because it'll make, it'll keep me awake because I have to pay attention to it. <laughs> That's a good thing. Right. Um, but, but I, I can appreciate wanting to uh, have a lot of quiet, especially, you know, these days going on, um, uh, you know, we, we talked a little bit about uh, the Midwest and, and all of this, the craziness that's going on right now. Yeah. And I feel like we need a little bit more uh, quiet and space to disengage from all of the noise that's going on in the country right, right now. Yep. 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 Yeah. It's crazy. I don't, it's, I know it's an overused uh, phrase, but we're living through strange times. Yeah. And it, and everything just feels uh, so, uh, so different, whether you know, it just doesn't feel settled. Just the energy around us just feels unsettled all the time. That's a good description. Yeah, yeah. So in in all of this, some of what helps me stay a little normal are these conversations and, and you know, talking about old music and the old days and, and those sort of things. Uh, speaking of uh, uh, music, um, the Temptations and some groups like that still come around and play. You still do those gigs? No, I'm, I'm, I'm. I, my my other joke is I, I'm not bi coastal. I'm bi geographical, so I'm not <laughs> I'm not in town long enough for somebody to go. Oh yeah, I call Wayne because I'm here for a while, and then I go back there, and then I've been in Indiana. That the phone call I always get: Are you in town? And I go. <laughs> 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 or, or, or where are you? One yeah. of the two. Yeah. Okay. Where, where are you? Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, you've been teaching at Indiana, you said, since 2014. 2013, so, 2013 actually. 13. Okay. So for like seven years or so, you lived there during the school year. Yeah. Pretty much. I come back, come back for the holidays and for the summer break. Mm. And, uh, had, on the most part, you're around the campus, but uh, the the Midwest is a is a really different cultural kind of place, isn't it? It depends upon where you are. Hmm. Bloomington is like a variation of Berkeley, California, but with more trees. Very <laughs> progress, very progressive city. Great food. They have a j history, a jazz history since uh, David Baker was there. Um, it's the only town I know of that has a Sun Ra festival every year. Really? Yeah. I, I participated. We put on the costumes and stuff, and we play Spaces the Place and Mars Calling, all those tunes from Sun Ra. <laughs> That's cool. That's, Bloomington is special. It's special. Um, it's interesting. I, um, I got an email today. There's like four places to eat, like right on the campus. They're mm -hmm. all closed down because of the virus. And the place oh. of that club where, where that would be held, that closed down too. And the students aren't even back yet. Oh. So, yeah. uh, so uh, we, it's, I know we always, all us old guys talk about the good old days. They might, mm. really, they might really be the good old days now. I, I know, you, you know, I, I'm, I don't, I'd like to be optimistic, but the way things are going, I can't see, uh, I've started making my living doing live sound for, for yeah. bands yeah. and, yeah. uh, I can't see a time when that that's going to come back for a while and, and at least a year, if at all. I agree. I, I, th I think we're being uh, tangent. We're fighting the virus as opposed to trying to learn how to live with it. Mm. And as long as we do that, the virus is always going to win. Mm. The other countries, that, you know, a lot of countries.
Christ in the world to live with it. Yeah. They're doing a better job of it. Yeah. We're doing Seems- about, about the worst possible job. Yeah, man. Well, I, you know, I'm hoping um, that it, the, the, we can get back together. You know, music is so much about being, a, it's a commu- way of communication. And, and everybody I've talked to as a musician, there's something special about standing next to somebody and playing and hearing them play and feeling the music come off of their body and yes. just feeling that energy. Yes. And as long as, as long as we have to do it this way, it, it, it doesn't convey the same. So at some point we're going to need to get together in order to keep it alive. You're absolutely right. Or else we're going to just have to accept it on a different level. Hmm. Yeah. One of the, one of the two. Yeah. <laughs> but I, yeah, you know, we're going to have to be able to get together somehow. And it, even if it's six feet apart. Um, it's such a strange thing. If, if you haven't, if you're a young person, it, it's fine because you wouldn't have experienced the, the way it was before. For me, mm-hmm. it's, it's hard. We're already talking about that. Um, if we do the Latin jazz ensemble now, we have to do the at least a minimum of six feet apart. Round that out by like 10 musicians. You're talking like almost a mm-hmm. football football field. And people like yeah. from the, Man- the Manhattan School of Music, Juilliard, everybody's having this conversation. Yeah. What about uh, we have chamber it's, orchestras and things like that? You need two sound stages for, for all those people to get together. Mm, yeah. So I, I think I, I don't. I don't really think it, it, that'll be able to happen at least anymore. I, that I, I can. I, see. I I don't see the solution as it stands right now. I don't see the solution. But yeah. things can change. Things can change. Mm. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna. Well, I'm, I actually have a cajon sitting next to me. There you and go. I use that. I use that for it. I got to knock on some wood. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, Wayne, you know, we're, we're at an hour and I, you know, I, I really wanted to talk to you about some more about the whole Midwestern thing that we talked about, but uh, given the state of affairs, I don't want to get into too much political stuff. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. There, there, there's plenty to go around. We can't get away from right. it. Oh, oh man. But the, the, the music, the, um, uh, the music is, is always my main focus here. And uh, uh, after we talked on Saturday, I was I was busy going like, okay, well, this is cool, and this is cool. So you gave me a whole lot to think about and and uh, stuff to read. And again today, even more stuff to think about too. Uh, 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 the different cultures of music that I kind of never even associated as being you know, Peruvian and all of those and Argentina and all of that into the Latin realm. A lot yeah. of times you don't really think about all that stuff. Yeah. Well, we're not exposed to it. The United States is so big that uh, you, a lot of us, if you're in California, you might not know the history of um, the Georgia Sea Island singers and things like that in South Carolina. I mean, the United mm-hmm. States is big. Yeah. You know, so I, I don't blame anybody for that. But if you want to study it, there's a whole lot of information out there, and it's all interconnected. The thing that connects most of the countries in the United States, except for maybe Mexico, is, is a, a vast amount of colonialism and how the music got native uh, with, with the – musicologists call them mere Indians, the natives that were here before Columbus and whoever came first, um, were here mixing with the Europeans and the African slaves. Mm. That is our history. 
and it's different in every country. Mm. Mm -hmm. Except for Canada. Right. Can <laughs> but th th that's the roots of our American uh, mm -hmm. music. Yeah, yeah. Our, our story is told by Colonial. You, well, one of the, um, our, our story of the New World is told through colonialism. And if you mm -hmm. go by de decades and centuries, you can see where the French were, where the Spanish were, where the Dutch were, where the Panama Canal was being built, and people from India came in um, and just brought their culture, and it all kind of blended together. And, and all of that is kind of how we ended up a yes, little bit. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. It was such a mix. Mm. Culturally, yeah. musically, everything. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm really happy that I got to to I ended up in California. <laughs> I you know, when I grew up in Nebraska, all I, and the, I, I think I might have told you on Saturday, the first records I bought were from bands in the Bay Area. And all I could ever think about was, I want to get there. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I was happy that I got there and, and have gotten to know uh, a lot of the musicians that we've, we all know and talk about in the Bay Area. And it's just been such a, now especially, I'm, I'm real honored to, to know uh, all of you and everybody that I've I've talked to and and the experiences I have being here in California and and, and musically I'm just man what a gift yeah I've been going through uh, my old uh, calendars and stuff and it's easy to forget how cool and all the great things that happened here musically because you're in the middle of it and mm. you have to take it take a step back and go oh yeah. <laughs> mm, yeah hey one i know we're at an hour but i just won what what was the first concert the first live performance you got to hear i have not thought about that it would have to have been in the late 60s oh no no that's not no 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 no, that's that's easy. Um, well, one that comes to mind, it might not have been the first one, was uh, I was walking through Golden Gate Park and one of those beings happened. A, mm. a concert, uh, and, you know, like what they used to do, like uh, whether it was the Jefferson Airplane, not the Starship, the Airplane, or the Grateful Dead, or whoever, they would get a flatbed truck and just do a free concert in Golden Gate Park. And all of a sudden, all these people would come, balls, uh, plastic, Balls are being thrown around, flowers, people dancing, the trumpet leave, and everybody would go. And if you go back in history, they, they were called beans. B E hyphen I N. And I was like, wow, what was that? <laughs> but I, I, was, <laughs> I went to the Fillmore West, I went to jazz clubs. Uh, that's all about the same time, but kind of all kind of morphed together around the same time. Who did I see? I'm trying to remember who I saw live. I gotta think about that because I was I was in a band. I was already in like a uh, an R and B band that was touring California. So I wasn't going out and seeing a lot of people. I was doing more playing than I was going and seeing people play. But after that, I got into that. Then I started going to the boat band and all those other clubs. I was playing in big bands with older musicians, a boys club band over at the YMCA over on Potrero Hill. Mm. And uh, Greg Adams was in that band from Tower of Power. That's just about 69, 68, just when he joined Tower of Power. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's what, my, <laughs> that's what my kids say when I tell them that now. They go like, you're that old? I go, yes, I'm that old. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the first thing they say is you're that old? <laughs> yeah, of course. Well, they, oh, okay, it's that or I'm on this record. You're on this record? Yes, I'm on this record. I'm on this record. So I have there's an Earth, Wind, and Fire record on my one tune system of survival. And I go, I'm, yeah. yeah, and I go, I'm playing on that. It's Jerry Hay and it's Mark Russo and me. Go, is that you? Yes, it's me. Is that really you? Yes, <laughs> it's me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. it's, 
<laughs> and I got, I got a story for you. Bootsy okay. Collins. Bootsy Collins is kind of a, adopted the Marching 100 in a, in Bloomington, Indiana, because he's from Ohio. So he comes in and he works with them and they do a show. And we're doing the Latin Jazz Ensemble, and we're rehearsing. And I look to my to the side, and it's Bootsy and his manager comes. He's just standing there watching us. And I said, "Come on in, come on in." And he, I was, I was pleased. He knew who I was. And I came over, gave me a hug and everything. And I turned to the band, said, you guys know who this is? And they went, uh, no. <laughs> oh, oh, the, <laughs> oh, 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 man, I, I love, you know, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I just kind of was was flashing on the, the kind of respect we get from our kids um, as, as you're, you're telling some of those stories. Um, but, you know, my my kids are always pulling that stuff on me, too. Like, you know, you're you're, you're really that old. They can't believe you actually did anything. And it's like, yeah, yeah. sure. Dad, yeah. Uh, so um, uh, it, did, did you go to school with Greg Adams? No, no. He went to a school in Daly City. Um, there was Westmore and Jefferson. I think Sly Stone was at Jefferson. He's like three years older than me. Mm. Um, but I think Greg was at Westmore over in uh, Daly City. But we, we, our paths crossed, and I, 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 I see him from time to time. You know, I, I think it's interesting that that all you guys. I, I mean, there, the, well, there was something in the water to get all of the talented musicians to come out of that time period. It was, you know a, golden, I mean? it was a golden era. I mean, there was a Mark Isham. I think we talked about that. He was with the Sons of Champlin. He's gone mm -hmm. on to become a great film scorer and orchestrator. Mm -hmm. uh, there were just really cool people here. And it was something in the, I still attribute it to the public school system. It gave mm -hmm. us an access to explore and grow we had great teachers we had people who loved the music jazz was not a stigma here i know in some places it's a it's you know it's you can't do that it's not legitimate music here it was encouraged mm. yeah yeah that's and just san francisco in general that the whole vibe of the city has always been different and encouraging and and open yeah uh that's the history that's why i was saying about the barbary coast i mean yeah. it's it was about as close to being lawless as you could be the whole shanghai thing and the prostitution uh i think i mentioned it to you william randolph her his mission in life like in 1918 was to shut down the barbary coast because he thought it was too wild he succeeded and for those mm -hmm. of you who don't know that the owner of the examiner patty Hearst's father mm -hmm. Or, or and, grandfather, I forget which one. Right. And he successfully shut it down. Yes, he did. And coincidentally, whoever was in Louisiana shut down Storyville about a year before or a year after. So both mm -hmm. red light districts went away around that time, which, curiously, now that I think about it, was when the Spanish flu started, about 1918. Now, I hadn't put those two things together. Interesting. Yeah, I think just a historical coincidence. Yeah, yeah, man. Well, Wayne, you, you've given me so much to think about. You, you know, both of my conversations with you are, have, have been fascinating and, and, and uh, an education for me. Yeah, I, I love talking with people about this stuff because I discover new things also. Yeah, and uh, the, the list of books, uh, I want to just mention the books that you told me to read that i that i i made notes and and started uh jazz on the barbary coast great book it really depicts the history of not only san francisco but oakland and why there is a dixieland jazz scene in sacramento and at one point down in salinas and monterey mm. and it's a really different kind of style of music too right yeah it, that's that's when ragtime, um, 
early early New Orleans music was coming out here, I mean, being and influencing what was happening. Um, if you want to get into the minutiae, if you look at the instrumentation of the Salvation Army Band, it's very similar to what was happening with early jazz. Because you had to be able to move around. You weren't using a piano. Banjo, you think about why ukuleles were so popular then. That was part of it. They could, they, if you didn't have a bass, they were doing the ground beat and keeping the time. Mm. You, look at some, you look at some of the early Cuban bands, same thing. No piano, you had a tres and a guitar. Makes sense. Yeah, it all ties, trust me, it all ties together. It's a, it's a linear progression through all of the Americas with these things. Right, right. And, and then the other book you told me uh, to, to check out, Harlem of the West. Yeah, which is a really fine book. It and really then, talks about the jazz scene here in San Francisco. Right. And then the, the one book that was it almost, it's sort of scary to read because it sounds like he's talking about me and my family is <laughs> Hillbilly Elegy. <laughs> I think everybody who considers himself a West Coast liberal should read that book and yes. see the, and see the other side. It, yeah. you'll, you'll understand the rest of the countries, you'll get a better appreciation, I won't say understand, of the, the middle America's angst and how they feel they've been left out. Right. And, you know, when you and I were talking, I, I mean, it, the description of, of that it, were my parents. I mean, that, that's, that's who they were. And, and when I was reading the, the bits of the book that I was reading, I'm like, man, that, that's my parents. You know, they're, they're angry because they never could, could get the American dream. There it is. That's, that's, that's all everybody wants. It's just to be treated fairly black, white, poor, whatever. And if you feel like somebody's taking it from you, that's when you get xenophobia. Right. Right. And, and my, my parents were just mad at anybody that thought they could take it away from them. I understand. I don't, I don't, I don't condone it, but I definitely understand where they're coming from. If you were there, your family was there before then, and all of a sudden you don't have the same cachet or standing right. that you've had for years, you feel cheated. Right. And so I, you know, I got out when I was 15, I couldn't wait to get away from there, but, um, uh, I understand where my parents were coming from just, just like you. Now I don't agree with it because I have a whole different mindset. But I, I understand that, that sort of thought process and why they're angry at everybody. I, I totally understand. I, I see it all the time. Bloomington is a special little town. If you go five miles north, south, east, west, it changes radically. I mean, mm. it's, a little, it's a little patch of blue and a sea of red. Yeah. <laughs> and all of the cities are sort of that way in um, the mid well, sort of. Sort of, yeah. There's you. You'd be surprised how big a jazz scene there is through that part of, like that's Southern Indiana on up to Indianapolis. There's mm. a jazz scene almost all the way through there in high school. They turn out a lot of great musicians. Wow. JJ yeah, John, JJ Johnson, Freddie Hubbard, Wes Montgomery all came out of the same area in Indianapolis. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, Indianapolis, Campbell, no, Campbell Hadley's Florida. There's a great, David Baker, great tradition, Indiana Avenue, their jazz scene through there. Oh, man. So that's something else that I want, I want to learn because when I was a kid, David Baker was, was the guy that was in charge of this school in, in Indiana, I believe. Yes, you're right. And that's i if somebody said go to school it's go to to iu indiana or go to north texas state at that yeah, time those were the two and at one point notre dame also oh really yeah late 60s early 70s mm, yeah i didn't that's a little before i, I was college bound mid 70s okay yeah you, you caught you caught a good a good wave there because it was building steam and more people were uh having jazz programs. Right. Yeah. So um, I never, never got into it. I, I just ended up just going on the road and playing in a band. So I never made it to college, but 
Um, but th when I was looking, it was Indiana and man, that the school of music would, was just phenomenal then from what I remember. Yeah. It's, it has a great history. The, uh, the time I've been there, I've learned a lot and mm -hmm. I didn't realize how many people, um, uh, came out of that school. Uh, Peter Erskine, Chris Bodie, all those people came came out of, uh, Randy Brecker, of course, Michael Brecker, came out of that program. Amazing. And those, man, what a list of players, those yeah. guys. Oh, and there's more. I'm scratching this. I'm trying to get some of the older guys there uh, to actually write about it so more people can know the history of it. Well, that would be cool. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's it. There's a, there's a varied history. We, we've had some honor concerts. We brought back some of the older guys who, uh, who were there with David Baker and made it happen. But it needs to be written down, not just for the general public, but for the students that come to the school also, so they can understand the history of it. Yeah, I like that. And, and I appreciate in you, your, your appreciation for the history of things and, and exactly. the history behind everything. It's important. It's important. Yeah. And, and for me, uh, I think the same thing. I, a uh, 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 history of like the Bay area. I'm always fascinated to hear stories about music that how people grew up with stuff. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's some people still around. I, 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 if you get a chance interview Pete Escovito, interview John Santos, People that went through the Mambo scene and the Latin scene, they're also Santana. At one point with Oh Tim was our special guest with the man. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, repeat when, that? Yeah. When Machete started, when the first gigs we did, Joe Henderson was our special guest artist. We were mm. always flirting back and forth between modern jazz and Latin jazz. That yeah, so uh, talking to some of those people would be great to, uh, you know, mix that all up because that that you know that's another part of the Bay Area is the Latin stuff that you know a lot of people don't talk about much. They're always talking about the funk and that or or the rock, mm -hmm. uh, Jefferson Airplane. But what about all the Latin stuff that was coming out of the Bay Area? Yeah. Um Oh, uh, a good friend of mine is doing a documentary on that. It's called Salt really? of the Last Mambo. And uh, we've been working, we made two records that kind of chronicles the Bay Area scene, uh, Salt de la Bahia, volume one and volume two. And um, Chuy Varela is in the documentary. We've had a lot of people like Benny Velarde, Pete Escobedo, and they talk about it going back to the 1930s when this was the beginning of what was happening with Mexican dances were called uh, tea dances at the time. And black musicians were playing. This eventually gets to the Cal Jader and it gets mm -hmm. you to Mongo Santa Maria, Armando Parasa. Without those guys, no Santana. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it all works. Yeah, it all works. So the last Mambo is going to be the the title of that documentary. Yeah, uh, she's she's put she's done a couple of showings on it, and it's going to be in a couple of film festivals. Um, bad luck, the virus has that screwed the whole thing up, but she it's really mm -hmm. been been well received. One thing about the virus is people really need content, so even if it doesn't make it. Uh, into a film festival or something like that. I'm pretty sure it'll end up like on PBS or something like that. Yeah, that would be good. It would be good to be able to to uh, see it and watch it. And yeah. it would be, you know, it would be great if somebody could make a, a really good documentary on the in, the totality of the Bay Area music scene. It's yeah, a lot of people are still alive. It wouldn't be that hard to do if there was an adventurous person that wanted to do it. Because really you're talking about, are you talking about funk? Are you talking about jazz or? All, all of it. If it, yeah. So I, to me, if the Latin jazz thing's cool too. The, when you read jazz on the Barbary Coast, there were a couple of bands that go back into the 1920s and 30s that were dance bands here. And they intermingled. Mm -hmm. 
kind of like the time of Fletcher Henderson and going forward into the swing era. But at that same time, there were a lot of other interesting things happening. And you could take it up into the beat generation with Jack Kerouac and the hipster thing that was happening with that and how that influenced the jazz scene and people like Sly Stone and et cetera. It all, and it would all connect. Well, and, and guys like yourself were in a lot of the different circles. Yeah, I, I'm, about, were, I'm, about, I'm about 1969, 1970, Basin Street West, uh, The Hungry Eye, Pinocchio's, all of those clubs, yeah. Because I was working on Broadway. On our breaks, we'd just walk up and down Broadway, and, just, and we knew all the bartenders and the bouncers, so they let us come in and just hang out. Yeah, and and I think I I told I told you this uh, uh, when I was first in the Bay Area, I went into Finocchio's to go see, and the reason we went is because because Harold Jones was playing drums, I think. Yeah. And and the we went to see the band because the band was so good, but they were playing behind female impersonators. Yep, that's what Pinocchio's is famous. That's that's what they were famous for. I'm telling you, go back. I've got a book here someplace. I think it's over here on the history of Broadway from the 19th century, and it, it chronicles all these clubs. If I can find that book, I'll I'll I'll, I'll send you an email with the title of it. Um, what was it? City Lights has that history too, like that the bookstore, like Columbus and Broadway. Mm. Yeah, it, is it? It's still open, right? City Lights. God knows. <laughs> you, you, I know. You, you know, you know, the Cliff House just got closed down the other day. It did. Yeah, they're out of business. They're out of that was two days ago, two or three days ago. The um, they oh. they, they, shut, they shut down for business. The ferry building shut down yesterday. No, this virus is vicious, man. You know, see, that's the thing that I I don't think people are quite grasping is is the fact that we're shut down. That there are businesses that are just that they're just not going to make it. They just can't. They can't sustain not having income. I I every day is a new day. That's all I say. I just get oh. up. And, I just get up and deal with whatever was going on that day. Man. And the Cliff House was still having music. They were still having guys come and play. They had bands six nights a week. Oh, what a what a bummer! Oh. I, think, I think the Cliff Cliff House, short of World War II, was open from eighteen seventy six up till now, or something like that. That long a history. Uh, was it Sutro Heights? Whenever Adolf Sutro was um, at his height, that was. Um, when the cliff house was built, even after the fires and all the different things like that. Right, right. And you know, there's there's one other place that you you might know about is uh, uh, the Grub Steak. I've heard of it. Well, it, it's um, uh, it isn't a real old, but it was the uh, it was originally owned owned by uh, some Portuguese people. It's a little cable car wedged in between a couple of buildings. They turned into a diner. Well, what street? What street was it on? It's on. It was on Pine and Polk. No, I don't know. Pine. You get. You got me there. Okay, it's on. It was on Pine between Van Ness and Polk Street, and I maybe it's been there since you know sixties, uh, seventies, or something. It wasn't real old, but it's been there for a long time. And uh, you know, there were uh, some venture capitalists came in and bought in all the buildings around it, and they're trying to close it down. And there's just places like that that uh, are are disappearing in San Francisco, and some of the the culture uh, that ha has been a staple of San Francisco for a long time is sort of it's kind of disappearing. It's inevitable. Yeah, yeah, it'll be different. You know, I mean that for for our young our children and grandchildren, it'll be it'll be a different city for them but but i sure yeah. miss some of the old the keystone corner oh Pearl. yeah yeah <laughs> yep 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 I, I watched some alfred hitchcock movies in san francisco and i can tell what streets they're on where the 
the, what is it, Dark Passage, the movie with Humphrey Bogart. You can tell mm. like they're over in the Fillmore on that side. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, the, well, Vertigo. Uh, the, and Vertigo. And Vertigo. And Vertigo. Vertigo. That was what I was just thinking. Yeah, yeah. That's all, all those. I, I, I love watching all those. And even the old Dirty Harry movies, you know? Man, the, yeah, I... I Chapter and verse, I can see where they are when they're in, when they're over at <laughs> West Portal and they have to go to Kizar Stadium. Whole thing. Yeah, and that wasn't the uh, the thing where he says, "Go ahead, make my day." That was in a a little restaurant on Third Street, right? I thought it was downtown. I'm not exactly sure. I know is it the first "Make My Day" or the second one? Because uh, the, the first one, it is loaded. The guy goes, "I gotta know." I got to know it was in there. Oh, that one. Yeah. It, yeah. it happens twice. That, right. It, it was the one where he, he was drinking the, the coffee and it was full, filled with sugar. And that's the first. Uh, that's the first one. Yeah. The second one is where, where there's no bullet in it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, the, the first one, I thought it was like uh, in a restaurant just south of uh, over by where uh, the giant stadium is now. I'm going to have to take I a look thought. at it. Probably, if I, if I, again, the police station is exactly the same. It's like right under where 101 goes out to it there. Um, yeah. I'm going to have to take a look at it again with that kind of an eye. Yeah, it, it, I, I just, man, I, I just always like watching all those old movies and going like, okay, so wh which one was this? Where was, where was this? Where was that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's uh, the same thing with Bullet, with Bullet too, with Steve McQueen, when they're going down oh. out toward Cow, Cow Hollow and all of that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love that the movie funny, too. The funny thing about Bullet is they're going in Cow Hollow, splice, you know, over by the baseway. Nothing, nothing in between. Right? Yeah. It's really interesting when they when they when they slice all the different scenes together. It doesn't make sense. You can't drive from here to there. They don't they don't connect. Yeah, but that's only if you know the city. Yeah. Okay. So, Lane, sure I've I, I've kept you an hour and a half. Oh, it's <laughs> oh, I have so many places to go. So many things. <laughs> oh i know it's like okay well what am i going to do next uh nothing <laughs> yeah. my, my choice is uh, my choice now is like should i do some work or should i eat you know that's, that's about it those are my that was my thought is what am i going to cook when i when i when i end this like what am i going to fix what i'm going to fix to yeah i've already I've already thought about that. I'm going to do a little yeah. bit of work on the computer, computer and then uh, settle in. All right. Well, Wayne, I'm going to play a little piece of music off of your uh, your Latin uh, Latin jazz, jazz Latin record. Okay. Uh, if that's okay. And I'll close out the show. And, and uh, thank you for being here and talking with me and, and giving me uh, so many insights and more books to read. Thank you, thank you, Jeff. Thank, I appreciate the platform to have the conversation. It, it's been great fun for me, and, I had, and I, I, had, I had a good time also. Good, and and I'm I may call upon you again to get more more um, uh, history, get more history uh, lessons. Feel feel <laughs> feel free. I got a whole bookshelf here of stuff on California and San Francisco. Oh. Sounds sounds fantastic. Someday when when all of this is over, and, and we could actually sit face to face, one thing that I would like to do is sit there with you and look at your books. Sure, I've got I've got them all in order here. Another thing about the virus, I've been able to put everything in order. I'm sitting here, the whole California ones in two racks up here. I can just go over and pick out a book and we'll talk about it. Oh man, that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, it I, is. I, I enjoy it. Yeah, I enjoy that kind of thing too, and and uh, of course my kids go, "Geez, Dad, come on!" I'm like, "No, <laughs> they, they don't have the same appreciation for things that I do." Of course well, not. Of course not. They're children. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> that explains it all right there. Yes, it, yes, it does. Okay. All right. So here comes, um, uh, and I don't even know if I can uh, pronounce this right. It's uh, uh, a, a tite gusta. You got a tite gusta to your taste. How how you like it? Okay, and I'm pretty sure this is this is what that is. Okay. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Jeff. Okay. Thank you. 